We will code the algorithms from scratch and get introduced to machine learning workflow. This is customer churn data for some bank. It contains a mix of categorical and numeric feature, including customer demographics and other. Exited is the variable we are interested in predicting. We'll refer to it as a class. It takes two values, zero and one. So it's a binary classification problem where one means the customer has already left the bank, also known as positive class. First thing to do at the onset of a machine learning exercise is to define the problem and choose an evaluation matrix. We have defined the problem to be a binary classification one. And since there is a class imbalance, positive class exited accounts for only 20% of the sample, I'll choose the call as an evaluation matrix and we will explore why later. The next logical step is to do an exploratory data analysis, EDA, to understand the data and identify pattern within, but for the sake of demonstration, we will follow a different approach. Features are at the heart of machine learning. Simply put, no matter what model you will choose, if your features are not representative of the underlying problem and do not capture the patterns in data, you will get bad results. Let's begin with feature engineering, which is a process consisting of feature extraction, transformation, and selection. We'll extract a new feature called loyalty that is tenure divided by age, and it show how loyal a customer is to a bank as a percentage. The higher, the more loyal. We'd expect loyal customer to have a low churn rate. For example, if you look at the first and third customer, you'll see that they both have the same age, but different tenure. Tenure means the, the length of period that the customer has stayed with the bank. This is reflected in their loyalty score. Next is the feature transformation, encoding geography into description representation, and no Note that it consists of three levels, categories, France, Spain, and Germany, but when encoding, we usually keep only two levels as the third is directly inferred from the other. If it is not Germany or Spain, it must be France then. If you look at the correlation among features, we'll notice that tenor is highly correlated with loyalty, and it actually makes sense because loyalty is derived from age in tenor feature. Apart from that, no significant correlation among features can be observed. We know that naive based classifier work best when features are conditionally independent. High correlation is a sign of dependency, so we will remove age and tenor from the, our feature set as they are already represented in loyalty feature. Selecting a subset of feature to train the model is part of feature engineering known as feature selection. There are several methods and statistical tests used in feature selection. I have discussed them in separate video linked above and in the description box. For now, we will just drop unnecessary features like customer ID, surname, row number, gender, and redundant feature like tenor, age, geography, as they are already captured in other features. This is our final feature set. Unlike what we have been doing earlier, we will split the data into training and testing set. Training set is the one fed to the model for pattern identification and parameter estimation. Testing set will only be used for prediction and performance assessment. Our first model will be Gaussian, where we assume that every feature is normally distributed. If you recall the four steps summarizing naive base classifier, step one has already been done, making an assumption about feature distribution. Step two is fitting or showing the model the training data and estimating the prior and distribution parameter. This is the estimated price for each class and it follows the same class imbalance we mentioned earlier. And these are the parameters for each feature. And instead of parameter box, we now use nested dictionary to save distribution parameter. Nested means there are several layers of dictionaries. First layer is for class 0 and 1, and second layer is feature parameter for each class. Third and fourth step are summarized in this classification report and confusion matrix, which display the performance of model on the testing set. Classification report display model performance for each class along with several evaluation metrics. Confusion matrix analyze classification report in numbers. It makes it easy to see whether the model is confusing two classes or not. For example, this number represents churn customers that are correctly predicted, while this number is the opposite. Columns represent prediction, while rows are two values, also known as ground truth. This representation of rows and columns is not fixed. It could be the other way around, but this is how it is represented here. Each of these features has a name. For example, the 154 customers that actually churned and correctly classified as churn are called true positive. The 1.8k customer did churn and correctly classified as no churn are called true negative on the opposite diagonal 129 customer actually did not churn but wrongly classified as churn is false positive meaning actual negative but predicted positive and 355 customer actually churned but classified as no churn is false negative actually positive but predicted negative what we are actually interested in is the result of the minority class or the positive examples because these are the customers that has actually churned, left the bank. We want to assess the model ability to pinpoint churning customer and we can do this using several evaluation metrics. First, let's look at the model overall accuracy of 81% and it basically tells us how many customers were correctly classified as a positive or negative. So it is equal to total number of churning customer classified as churn, the 154 plus total number of loyal customers that were classified no churn, 1.8k divided by total number of customers in the 
testing set. We can immediately notice a problem with such matrix being shadowed by the number of loyal customers. Let's assume that only loyal customer will correctly classify it. So accuracy would be equal to 1.9k total loyal customer divided by total customer. This is equal to 80%. Almost insignificant reduction from previous results where the model correctly classified some churning customer, but so significant in terms of model assessment as in that case, our model simply fails to capture any churning customer. Thus useless. So in light of class imbalance, accuracy is a misleading matrix. What if you want to know how many positive predictions are correct, those that are classified as one? In other words, how likely our predictions are to be correct? We will then use another matrix known as precision, that is correct positive prediction, the 154 divided by total positive prediction, regardless of being correct or not, 154 plus 129, which is equal to 54%. This means that each time the model makes a positive prediction, a sharing customer, there is a 54% chance of being correct. But what if we are interested in assessing the completeness of our prediction, that is, of all sharing customers, how many did the model correctly classify we would then use another matrix known as recall that would be again the correct positive prediction the 154 but this time divided by correct positive prediction plus wrong one 154 plus 355 which is equal to 30 percent this means that our model only captures 30 percent of churning customers now when it comes to which matrix to choose the answer would be it depends first of all there will always be a trade-off between precision and recall to some extent maximizing one will negatively affect the other another consideration is the problem itself the minority class in balanced classification always carries higher weight than majority class for example if a customer churn that's a lost revenue stream in case of fraud detection which is usually an imbalanced classification a positive instant means that theft has occurred money is lost and reputation is damaged that's why i prefer recall to other metrics in imbalanced classification problem we will We'll see later how to maximize it and what on what basis to conclude if it is satisfactory or not. Instead of using single training and testing data, we can use another technique known as K fold cross validation, where the data is split into K groups called fold. For each fold, a distinct training and testing set are initialized. So instead of having one training and testing set, we would have K sets. The model is assessed based on the average performance across the folds. In this example, we use stratified K folds. Stratification ensures that positive class is equally represented in both training and testing sets since our data is imbalanced. We print the result for each fold, the recall score for training and testing set. It's important to keep track of the model performance on training and testing data to spot over or underfitting problem. That is where the model per perform better on training data than the testing one. It's called overfitting or just bad on both, underfitting. So far, we have been using mixed naive based classifier that we have coded from scratch, assuming Gaussian distribution of all features. Let's compare these results to established models for spotting conceptual or coding errors. Using scikit-learn, a popular Python machine learning library that contains many models, including Gaussian naive based, we get the following results, where the model fails to capture any positive class. You can see that accuracy is 80%, even with zero correct positive prediction that's why it's misleading as we mentioned earlier so what's actually happening if you look at the descriptive statistics we can immediately observe a scaling problem where scale of some features are widely different than the rest for example estimated salary and balance is in thousand while loyalty is between zero and one and when we look at the histograms we observe a mix of distribution rather than gaussian but that's something we already know if we scale the data using mean and max scalar, which puts every feature on a scale of 0 and 1, we get this summary statistic that shows a well-behaving scale data. By the way, naive base does not require and is not affected by feature scaling. We already saw this in our implementation of mixed naive base model. The problem is that we are forcing non-Gaussian feature on a Gaussian model where some of the assumption and the way calculation and the approximation were designed may be violated, thus requiring these extra steps. In a nutshell, model implementation may differ from one package to another, but the final result should be the same. Now we use the scale data to train SQL learners model and we get the exact same result in terms of estimated priors, parameters and prediction results. These are the parameters, the mean for 0 and 1, compared to ours, they are the same. Let's unleash full potential of our mixed model and see if it makes any difference to prediction results. Once we have defined a distribution for each feature, we ran into the zero frequency problem where category one of number of product feature for no churn class is not present. In general, this is an execution error telling you that there is something wrong with your code. It traces the error to where exactly it was triggered. This line is a trigger. It's meant to be this way, validating absence of zero frequency problem when the user do not specify a smoothing alpha. So it triggers whenever there is zero frequency problem, but no smoothing alpha defined. Stopping the execution of the code. Don't worry, we will discuss this code in details later. 
we know how to address this problem using Laplace smoothing. So we have added alpha to B1 and refitted our model and got slightly improved performance, especially on the positive class, which is desirable. A 2% increase in recall and a whooping 16% increase in precision. Now our positive classification has a 70% chance of being correct, but still completeness of our model recall is suffering at only 32%. And this is mainly because of the imbalanced classification. One way to maximize recall in imbalanced classification problem without doing any fancy stuff is threshold moving. The default classification threshold is 50%. Any observation with class posterior probability above 50% is assigned to that class. So we can actually decrease this decision threshold till we reach a satisfactory result. How to define satisfactory? It depends. Decreasing classification threshold reduce false negative but at the same time increase false positive so it comes down to the cost associated with each error. In our channel problem a false negative means lost business while false positive means misdirected marketing efforts. So the cost of promotional incentive sent to a loyal customer may be insignificant compared to total loss of customer. At the end loyal customer will become more loyal hopefully. This is game data we used earlier and how Mixed Naive Base looks on it. Since SQLM doesn't have Mixed model to compare against, we will compare our Bernoulli and categorical implementation to those of SQLM. We can see that both estimated the same parameters. If you want to calculate Bayes rule directly for single event, we can use pandas, group by or cross tab. These figures are normalized showing percentage instead of row counts for PC given E. Let me show you the code. We group by E and count class occurrence. If you recall get into rule, we first get into what's after the sign that's E, then find the probability of what's before that's C. If you use cross tab, we normalize by index. For PE given C, we switch things around, group by C, get into C, then find probability of E, and in cross tab, we normalize by columns. These are equivalent to Bayes rule for single event and it's a quick way to compare condition probability to price for categorical distribution. Let's skim through the rest of the code used to generate this notebook. The process of fitting model is pretty straightforward. Here we are comparing our implementation to SQLearn's Bernoulli feature, humidity and wind. First, we select the subset of the data frame, transform humidity and play to discrete representation using map method. Map assigns new feature to old ones as shown here. For example, high will be represented using one and normal zero. Now assign distribution to each feature. We instantiate a dictionary with features as keys and distribution abbreviation as values. Zip combines element wise. So for the two lists here, one for feature and one for feature distribution the first element of first list will be assigned to the first element of the second list and so on here we instantiate an instant or object of mixed naive base classifier class and call it m the object is initialized with smoothing prior alpha then fitted with training set class column and distribution mapping we will go through this line again in details when we discuss mixed naive base class what's important now to know is the name of each item this is class object the class object initiation the dot notation for accents the class object and fit which is one of the class methods do the same for sqlearn instantiate then fit fitting means training the model or showing the model the data so it learns the pattern within now m and b and b are fitted models that we can extract a lot of information from for example, if you want to know the estimated parameters P, we can call M, then parameters dict 0, select the parameter of class no play, and for SQLearn, it is stored in feature log proba. These are log probabilities, so we exponentiate to compare against our calculations since we are not using log probabilities in our implementation. Finally, put everything inside a data frame. In threshold moving, we capture the probability of positive class from the model stored in pred proba using dot notation. It's an array, so we are slicing the array, capturing all rows and only the second column that holds the positive class probabilities. Then assign new classification threshold. This is a Boolean array of true and false. It's true when probabilities are greater than threshold. Finally, pass this to a classification report and confusion matrix for evaluation. Since we are using an interactive widget, it accepts a function, so we wrap the, all this into a function and initiate the widget. It accepts a function and detail of the parameter we wish to interact with our function has only one parameter which is the threshold so we set the mean value the max value starting value step size from the mean and max and finally a brief description when it comes to scaling and regardless of the scaler used it is important to fit the scaler on training data only then transform test data this prevents data leakage where the model knows about testing data in advance which is not desirable if we are seeking a fair assessment of model performance so for example the key parameter for min and max scaler is the mean value and max value of the data if we fit the scaler with the training data first it will capture those parameters from the training data and apply them to testing data however if we fit it with the whole data set training and testing the parameter of testing data will be captured and passed to our model because the training data was scaled using testing data parameters this is a helper function 
used to train and evaluate the model you can reuse this one line of code to train and assess different models now let's understand how this function was built the first thing to do when creating a function is to use def which stands for define then name your function and stamp listing what this function needs to actually function these are known as parameters our function accepts a model data name of target variable and two other boolean parameters Ignore this as we will revisit it later. KFCV checks for k fold cross validation. Next comes the logic of the function, the steps to undertake for achieving its intended use. We want this function to accept the model, split data, then fit and evaluate the model. First, instantiate model object. If k fold, then specify k fold strategy. Here we are using stratify k fold. Shuffle true is important if the data is arranged in a specific sequence and we don't want this sequence to prevail when splitting the data into training and testing set. For example, if there is a gender feature consisting of two categories, male and female, where samples of female are listed first followed by males, shuffling ensures that the data is randomized across both sets rather than each holding samples of a specific category. Random stat ensures reproducibility so that you and I get the same results when running this code. Next, create list to collect prediction result for each fold in instantiate fold counter for iteration now iterate over the fold default is 5 and it's an 80 20 split 80 training 20 testing in each split specify training and testing set if we are using mixed naive base then we have to pass training and testing data combined then feed the model otherwise if we are using sklearn we just pass x and y separately then use the trained model to predict both training and testing sets to check for over underfitting calculate desired evaluation matrix in our case recall if there are more than one class we use the average finally for each fold we print the fold number recall score for both training and testing and the confusion matrix update recall score per fold and raise the fold counter for display purpose lastly print average recall across fold that is the mean of results container we have instantiated earlier note that in print statement we can define preferred separator for example empty string aligns everything while backslash n prints on your line if not doing cross validation we do the same using single split instead of k fold loop imagine having to write this every time we test a model compared to this one line we saw earlier this is how helpful a function can be if we recall we stored the estimated distribution parameter in a parameter box for later use during prediction we'll just do the same here with the help of data class these are just containers for parameters so we can access them using the dot notation data class requires python 3.7 and later we'll instantiate a class container for gaussian parameter and call it parameter gaussian then specify a name for each parameter and their data type mu and sigma of load d type if left like that we cannot edit or access mu or sigma using the dot notation it will give us an attribute error saying that parameter gaussian object has no attribute called mu thus we have to initialize this class with another function so mu and sigma be known to be part of that class the decorator add data class do this for us so we don't have to write the initialization function each time we create a parameter container think of the creator as call for backup or support it beefs up another function or class with the methods included in that decorator we can now access mu and sigma using the dot notation or edit them like we are doing here formatting display to third decimal point and i'm ignoring self on purpose as we will discuss the structure of python class in details later to summarize, data class is a decorator and the decorator is just a collection of methods that beef up another function in class without having to be retied at each intended use. We do the same for each type of distribution we intend to add to our mixed naive base model, n and p for binomial, p for binoli, and so on. You can add as many as you wish. Now the star of the show mixed naive base classifier. We'll look at pseudocode to understand how it works in plain language, then dive into the actual code itself. First, we define mixed naive base class, which serves as the blueprint of our classifier. Python doesn't know what is mixed naive base classifier, and the class is like the manual for it. Each class consists of a set of functions, which are called methods. Functions and methods have similar purpose, however, a fundamental difference lies in the execution. Functions are independent, which means that they do not have to be part of an object or class, and can be called from anywhere using the function name. When function is written inside the class, it becomes a method for that class, which means it can no longer be called from anywhere using the function name function name rather dot notation after calling the object or class first thing to note is the word self in each of these methods which refers to the class itself for example let's say i'll create an object or instance called m for model and assign mixed naive base class to it so m equal mixed naive base whenever i call m dot fit which is a method inside the class python will automatically pass the classifier object m as the first parameter to this class without me having to do it explicitly as long as self is one of the parameters of the methods like we are doing here the logic behind it is simple when you call m.fit what are you fitting the classifier is just instantiated m what are you fitting it with bunch of other stuff 
So fit method manipulates the class itself along with other stuff that are not part of the class yet. If I want to extract the estimated parameter after fitting the model, I can assign them to the variable self inside the fit method and say self.params equal parameters. Now they became an attribute of the class object m which can be accessed using the dot notation m.parameters. In a nutshell, self is a reference to itself, the class object or instance. Use it whenever the need to manipulate or access an attribute of that class. Okay, what about init method or initialization method? It's an object constructor. If you go back to our model object or instance, and let's say we want to initialize the model with a user defined prize or smoothing alpha, in that case, we have to use init method passing to itself and the parameter we wish to initialize. When m is initialized this way, these parameters can be used and manipulated by other methods within the class. If you remember the data class decorator, this is one of the methods it adds whenever it's called. To summarize, use init if you want things to happen automatically to the class object or instance when it is instantiated. So our class consists of initialization method, a fitting method where priors and parameters are estimated for each class, and finally a predict method where the conditional probability and class assignments are determined. You are now ready for a quiz. Do you think that the sequence or order of the methods inside the class really matter? Hopefully you will get that right. Now let's dive into the code itself. First initialize the class with user defined priors and alpha, assign them to self variable. It's always a good practice to include docstring, which is a brief explanation of the code that follows. Then define fit method, which accepts data frame, class column name, and the distribution of each feature. The function first checks if the number of pass distribution equal number of features, excluding target column, of course, if no alert the user. Assign the name of each class, their count, and feature distribution to self variable because they will be used as input to other class methods, and we want also to access them from the class object. Now, Check for user defined priors. If no, estimate them from the training set using the value count method with normalizing parameter for probabilities instead of row count. Sort them and finally save them as dictionary. You see, this is an example of class operation. Data frame DF is an object of pandas class which holds our data in a tabular form. Value count is a method that retrieves counts of each unique value inside the column of pa or panda series, and we are able to access this method using dot notation, similarly sort index and two dex. Okay. We have our prize now. It's time to estimate distribution parameters. First, instantiate containers for parameters per class to be updated with parameters per feature. So this is the first layer of the nested dictionary we mentioned earlier. Then for each class, filter the data of only that class. Instantiate container for parameter. This is the second layer of the nested dictionary. Then for each column and corresponding distribution, we are accessing keys and values of a distribution dictionary where keys are feature and values are the corresponding distribution. This is the dictionary created using zip function earlier. We just estimate the parameters. For example, if D is N, which refers to normal distribution, first assert that data type and nature of distribution match. If not, alert the user. If user passed N for categorical feature, it will throw an error. Then estimate the parameters. Note that this at this point, the parameters are the maximum likelihood estimate. Finally, store the parameter in the data class container we just created. Similar for the rest, not gonna go over all of them. They are pretty much the same implementation except for discrete Bernoulli. Apart from D-type and distribution mismatch checks, we do another check if user did not pass moving alpha and there is a zero frequency problem. If alpha is zero, check that column mean is not equal zero, which means that there is at least one positive instance, as this is Bernoulli distribution where column consists of only zero and ones who otherwise alert the user if everything is okay get p of success the ones then store it if smoothing account for alpha and update the parameter dict this is a plus smoothing function and two represent the number of levels or categories per feature Categorical features are pretty much the same. Identify missing categories using list comprehension, then check for zero frequency if no smoothing. If okay, get parameters and using normalized value counts and save it to dictionary. If smoothing and missing categories, calculate total categories per feature, account for the missing ones, apply Laplace smoothing for existing feature, then for the missing one and update the parameter dictionary. If smoothing with no missing categories, get total categories directly and update the parameter dictionary. After estimating the parameters, update feature and class dictionaries, assign estimated price and parameters to variable then return fitted mixed naive base classifier final step is to make prediction first instantiate prediction array that will hold pc and x with total rows equal to total observation and total columns corresponding to each class if class name happens to be string we will use this counter to update the array later now for each class ensure to iterate in a sorted manner for correct argmax index argmax in python returns the index of the max element in the array if class one was the first in the array and argmax returns zero you would assume that it is class zero unless you know what you are doing start with probability of one to be updated by px given c later 
We want this variable to end up array like of px given c that is updated at each iteration with corresponding feature per class. This will be the input to pred array columns after multiplication with class priors. Fetch the distribution parameter of that class, iterate over all feature and calculate px given c, applies a proper probability distribution function using the correct parameters. So for Gaussian feature, we will use test model norm function, which is the Gaussian PDF, passing to it mu and sigma, then calculating the PDF for each feature value. Reshaping to match spread array dimension, then update the initial probability, which is now an array-like variable. Same thing for the rest, couple of things to note though. For continuous uniform distribution, if x is outside the limit of a and b, return 1 instead of 0, because if 0, it will mess up the whole multiplication process resulting in a final probability of 0. For binary distribution, we use p of success if x equal 1, else 1 minus p is applied if x equals 0. So we are accounting for non-occurrence of event as we mentioned earlier. Additionally, we can use log transformation to prevent overflow problems resulting from getting very small numbers when multiplying probability together. Using log will change calculation a bit since all multiplication will be changed to addition. This is an example of what's going change. Lastly, check for PC and X, then update the prediction array. We are using class label 0 and 1 for slicing the array. Slicing can only be done using numbers, so if class is string, we will use the class counter variable. Python use zero indexing, so at first iteration, we are capturing all the rows and first column. This reads all rows and columns starting 0 and ending 1, which translate to column 0, the first column, as ending index is not considered. For the second iteration, it will read start at column 1 and end at 2, which means the second column. Lastly, and finally, we retrieve three things. First, PC and X, the unnormalized posterior. Then, the probability. This is a vectorized operation dividing each element in rows of spread array by the sum of the rows, giving us normalized posterior. And lastly, class label argmax spread array. Thanks for watching. I hope you find this useful. See you next.